Count your blessings. Have you ever heard that saying? I think a very valuable reminder that this uh, idiom, this expression, a very valuable reminder at a time when we can easily get overwhelmed by negativity and all the atrocities and war and cruelty that is happening in the world. I felt reminded of that saying yesterday in this beautiful full moon night we had a little bit of rain. It's called the rainy season retreat because in ancient India or even in India nowadays, and that's the time of the rainy season. Here at Damagiri is actually the dry season or rainy season retreat. But quite auspiciously, we had some rain just when we started the Rasa, and we also had some rain just two days ago. And I think that rain had taken out you know, all the dust and a little bit of smoke from a few fires nearby. And we had you know, this uh, exceptional clear air and this super bright moon. I checked it wasn't actually a super moon or anything, but it subjectively appeared really, really bright and radiant. I couldn't walk under the covered walking path without requiring any light. There's, you can see shadows and it's so bright and you can even guess some colors. And then walking away and I had cooled down, but not too cool. And just uh, reflecting about the uh, blessing and the benefit of being able to live that kind of life as a monk, to have that kind of conditions for bhavana, to have a kuti, and that kind of location, to have friends in the holy life like Ajahn Muneyo, Ajahn Kantiko, uh, being able to stay together with uh, real friends and the Dhamma, uh, Gary and Peter, the two uh, laymen who were staying with us in the Vasa. It's really uh, amazing to, to have that. And then the support. Sometimes to me it's almost a small miracle. I mean, being able to, to have that lifestyle in that beautiful natural environment when I look out for my kuti, I'm looking towards the north and uh, sometimes I can't see a single light. Although I have a very wide view because I'm looking directly towards Dagila National Park to the north. The rolling hills, we are 160 meter high on top. And then the rolling hills go up to about the 700 meter on Nebo, Mount Glorious. And that's what I'm overlooking. The only thing, the light usually on that side is one flight path, which is near to the north of Dagila National Park. I usually go along there when I come back from Asia, from Singapore, Bangkok and so on. But so far that I just see the lights in the distance, but I, I can't hear anything at all. It's too, too far away. But then it's nothing. And that is only the 45 minutes drive from the city center of Brisbane. Now you all know the encouragement of the Buddha now to stay in the present moment. And sure enough, now for deepening samadhi or to develop a liberating insight, it will be impossible if the mind is wandering in the past and into the future. But the teaching of the present moment shouldn't be misunderstood that one can live in one's whole life totally only being in the present moment. That is not possible. And from time to time, the one has to do some skillful planning for the future. And from some time to time, it is also beneficial to reflect on the past, to learn something or to develop the quality in which we call mudita, sympathetic joy, which we call an anumodana, rejoicing, which we also call an gratitude, 
and noticing how much we actually have to be grateful for. A grateful person is not just someone who expresses the gratitude and what they have received. Now, the first step is simply becoming aware that there is something to be grateful for. And uh, we are often trained to complain, to find things which are not good, and for sure we can all find that. Not trying to look at the world with uh, pink glasses and going into denial, I'm totally aware. What a miserable place and how much uh, outright atrocities and war are happening. But if we always focus on that, and our mind can uh, start thinking that we become uh, depressed and discouraged, embittered. So occasionally it is so important that to count our blessings, to develop uh, gratitude and uh, mudita for the good things we have. And, and yesterday at the end of this rainy season retreat, and it came quite natural to me to just be stunned and awed that this lifestyle is still possible in, in the 21st century in a non-Buddhist country, and if we are small minorities, only 2.5% 2, 2 Buddhists in Australia, even less in the Theravada. And if you look at the state of the world, now how would you practice if you are in uh, Ukraine, in Donbass, getting uh, rockets and artillery slammed onto you or being drafted into the army and suddenly finding yourself in an earth hole and being bombed by drones and artillery and having to fight for your survival when the others come running at you and so on. Now in uh, Gaza right now, there's so many places and in, uh, in this kind of world, uh, commercialization, everyone only after uh, profit and getting money and materialism. Uh, I'm, I'm not denying any of that. Uh, attitude of counting your blessing and anamodana is not a denial, and not saying these bad things don't exist. Everything is fine. We are all nice little teddy bears and unicorns and everyone is loving each other. And that would be denial. That's not the case. But uh, both these things exist. And we have to gauge the state of our mind, which one we should be paying attention to. And if our mind is already angry and uh, upset and maybe slightly depressed, and then just to pay attention to all the details in an awful war, that will usually not lead to real letting go. Before contemplating uh, Dukkha quite intensively, you know, the mind needs a certain basis in samadhi, a certain uh, level of maturity in the faculties. And even when that is there, anyone can't do that all the time. And even the great uh, Kuba Ajans, when they described uh, their practice at a very advanced state, uh, they would contemplate. And of course, if you really develop insight, you have to look at dukkha and impermanence and disappointment. But then they would rest the mind in samadhi. And samadhi is a state now of uh, the most intense and, uh, and refined forms now, of bliss and rapture. Or maybe an equanimity if it's very deep, now, which even goes beyond bliss and rapture. And then they come out and then they can face it again. However, I think you know, many people nowadays you know, glued to <laughs> their devices and the media and, and following the disasters and wars and atrocities happening. Now their mind is usually not in a state that uh, looking at so much dukkha and so much disappointing stuff that it would lead you know, to letting go and deep insight. Other way around, the first deep insight and then as a result of deep insight letting go. But uh, and the people get wild up, get uh, angry or they get uh, depressed or hopeless. If we notice that in our mind, 
without denying anything, we can acknowledge these things exist. But if we notice you know, this is now just driving our mind down, then it's the time to start reflecting, counting our blessings. When I ordained uh, in Sri Lanka many years ago, I noticed I have an anniversary, 25 Vasa in Australia now. <laughs> I spent 25 rains retreats uh, in Australia. So more than 25 years ago, uh, practicing in Sri Lanka, every evening we would do this recitation it is difficult to attain a human rebirth. Sometimes people feel there's nothing really to count blessings in my life, and I only have so much trouble and difficulties and so much hardship. No, what could I be grateful for? No, you're a human being. And in the wider scheme of things, no, that is very rare. Now, how many years have live a, a human beings been living on this earth. 200 million years or something, maybe had a dinosaurs and human beings in the world, whatever, 100,000 years according to modern science. I'm not sure how correct that is, but I think 100,000, a couple of 100,000 years. I compare that to 200 million years of dinosaurs. Now, how many ants are there? how many worms and so on compared to human beings. So it is a rare and special opportunity. That's one reflection. If you don't know how to start, my life is so tough and miserable, what can I count as a blessing? That certainly is a blessing. And it gets even better because we are born as a human being at a time when the teaching of the Buddha is still available. We may not, in this life, no, we have not met the Buddha. I mean, that is no exceedingly rare no, that you have that kind of power in me, that you're born when the Buddha is actually walking around and teaching. But even then, uh, if the Buddha's teaching is still around and we have confidence, the faith, conviction, in the teaching, that is actually better than meeting the Buddha and maybe having not faith in him. Even when the Buddha was walking on this earth, uh, I don't know exactly the percentage, now, but the majority of people in India may not even have had faith in him at that time. So being born as a human and at a time when the teaching of the Buddha is available, the sasana and not just the teaching, the infrastructure. There are still no great Arjuns. These have passed away. Lumpur Liam is alive. Lumpur Tongdeng is alive. We had them here this year. That kind of being are still in existence. There are good monasteries. There's opportunities you know, to go on retreat, to even ordain, you know, to live as monks and nuns. And if you have faith, and these opportunities are there, born as a human being, sasana, now this is basically you know, the jackpot in the lotto. Even just the human being is already a lotto win. And uh, additionally, in having faith, in the teaching at a time when they are available, you know, the Buddha Dhamma leading to Nibbana. Now that is basically the jackpot. And the really nice forest monastery is on top of that, an icing on the cream, uh, <laughs> uh, an icing on the cake. There's a cream of the crop, and it's the very best. And it was uh, beautiful, you know, walking on my simple walking path, but with these kind of views and looking back now on uh, three months, I'm sometimes surprised that we don't have you know, a waiting list uh, with hundreds of names of people who want to come for retreat, or monks wanting to stay, and people wanting to ordain. It's such a beautiful life, and, and people are you know, willing you know, to come every single day and you just had the food. We have that. Now, Sunday is a bit more than 
weekdays, no, but basically we have every day you know, that kind of dedicated food. We just had uh, Alex visiting, uh, and he used to be the attendant monk, the upper talk of Lung Poliem for many years. And he later disrobed, also due to health reasons. And recently he had a really big operation, which only one doctor was even willing to take on. And he was lucky, and he pulled through, and then uh, he came here for a visit. And one thing he mentioned, he was so happy when someone came and offered him additional food in hospital, because the food is not really very good. And he also remembered, and we talked about that, he said when he was a monk, and he received this food, which is given as dana, that it seems to have a, a different kind of quality. And I was intrigued by that because I had the same feeling. The one is the material base of the food, now that will be the same wherever you get that from. But I remember one lady I know when they come to offer food here, there's a real big event and uh, she is uh, meditating and she is playing uh, the Paveta chanting while she is preparing the food and she keeps her mind uh, really focused. That is maybe a little bit uh, more than most people do, no? but uh, there's always no, this very wholesome intention no, of doing that as an act of generosity, of doing that as an act of uh, no, supporting the Sangha, making good karma by the maintaining the organization, the people you know, who have transmitted the Dhamma for two and a half millennia. And I honestly believe you know, that there is something in the food when you eat that, which is different. And even if you go you know, to a three Michelin star restaurant or a five star hotel, you know, the people working there, you know, they may actually be not happy and on that day they would love to stay home because they have problems or they're a little bit sick and then they go there and they just cook because it's their work and they do it for money. So I think that you, you can't get that particular quality in, in the food and to me I, I think we can somehow notice that. And I was intrigued that he also noticed that particularly when he was really weak and uh, very exhausted ne, from that uh, sickness and the big operation. And to live a life ne, where that comes every day. You don't even have to think about food. Just come here and, and that quality of food is offered. I'm sometimes surprised why people are not trying ne, to get in even just for the food and <laughs> a nice life. But, but apparently they don't do it. It's, And then being able, they're usually going back in the afternoon, having quiet time. Of course, you know, the uh, kutis, you know, the little bit ugly ducklings, you know, just these you know, metal, demountable donga. But you know, in that environment where it's put, uh, I'm exceedingly happy there. I honestly haven't met a, a single abbot yet where I would wish to swap kutis. <laughs> Many have uh, actually much nicer and uh, cookies, cabins, much bigger and so on, but uh, location. In real estate, it's all location, isn't it? It's location. And uh, in terms of location, I honestly, I haven't seen a single one where I would want to swap. Although it's only a metal box. I mean, it wouldn't work. In Germany, you couldn't live in that kind of thing. It's too cold and so on, or even uh, or in England. And a lot is the weather. I wouldn't want to be in that uh, metal box uh, in uh, English November or something. That would be something different. But here, it's just perfect. As a famous statement from, I think it was a philosopher, was it Kierkegaard? The hell, hell is other people. <laughs> That's what he said. I think it's also true for heaven. If you consider 
And what really makes the quality of your life, and I think that's really the uh, people you have uh, around you and the people you interact with. And sometimes people, you know, if they have you know, their loved ones with them, they would be willing you know, to face almost any hardship, any kind of climate or even war, rather than uh, being in the presidential suite in the Hilton, uh, uh, completely isolated, never being allowed to meet anyone. On the other hand, uh, like like prison, uh, American prison, or if you read from people who have had that experience, uh, it's just very tough not to live with that kind of people together. So it's good not to occasionally you know, reflect and uh, count the blessing of what kind of persons we are able to associate with and to have contact with. And again, one can have an attitude of complaining and, of course, uh, fully awakened our hands who are freed from defilements are quite rare nowadays. And if we have a fault finding mind, we may find fault even with the other hands and complain about whatever idiosyncratic character traits they still have. It's not like they lose all their character traits, only the defilements are gone. But they can be in a very different and have certain uh, vasana inhabited uh, tendencies uh, from lifetimes. If it's not exactly a defilement, uh, then you, you may not like that. Uh, but uh, below that level, obviously uh, everyone has their uh, shortcomings and drawbacks and kilesas. But uh, if we look at uh, the, the bright side, uh, the good qualities from people we know and interact with, at least uh, yesterday when I did that, uh, you, you fear there's so much to appreciate and to be grateful for. Maybe I have a bit better situation than many others. I lived together with monks and this year and we had uh, senior monks and two laymen who were willing to give it uh, the whole veins retreat and even longer. Or Gary two months and now he's staying another month is also more than three months. Now that uh, is probably a noticeably higher standard than what you meet in, out in the world. But still, if we are willing to look and recognize good qualities in people we know, I think we can find a lot. Otherwise, they get ordained. <laughs> and then you're in a, in a sangha. And although that's not like I think they're all totally fantastic and enlightened, but uh, if you compare it with what's going out there in the world, there's uh, pretty decent people there. There's a huge privilege you know, to be part of that. But when Maneo pointed out to me, uh, we have three Western monks uh, hitting 50 veins retreat this year. Uh, three Canadian, curiously, you know, Ajahn V, Ajahn Tevadamo, Lumpa Pasano, I mean, in uh, Asia and in, in traditional Buddhist countries, you have many monks, but uh, among Western monks, there's still quite a rare club. Germany is doing fairly fine, not so much recently, you know, but I can remember at least four monks and also one nun who lived in Sri Lanka who made it to at least 50 Vassan. So it's a huge benefit and I feel very happy not to be able to be part of uh, that Sangha and in a very good tradition, the forest tradition, uh, Lumpur Cha and all the associated monasteries. Again, not perfect, but if you look at the good side, a lot to be grateful for, a lot of blessings. And then I have this Vinaya of the Buddha, which the longer you live, and now it's uh, 28 Vasa as a monk, the longer you live now with these rules, the more you notice now how unbelievably wise and beneficial they are, and uh, that a lot of the supreme wisdom of the Buddha comes out not only in the Dhamma, which is usually more known in the lay community, but also in the rules of discipline that the Buddha has given us. 
Some have effects and you don't immediately recognize. One which always strikes me is not having money. That may sound quite scary, and if you're in lay life, the idea of not having any money is probably a rather frightening one for you. It was also frightening for me when I uh, started this, or was researching for this PhD which I wanted to do in India, and then I felt no, I take so much effort and mental engagement and so on. I, I want to really live the spiritual life 100%. I haven't even fully uh, encountered the Dhamma at that stage. No, I wasn't really a, a Buddhist uh, taking refuge. So it was more like a diffuse idea of meditating in the Himalayas. And I thought, now how do I do that? Now how do I survive? I had some money at that time, but with some stage one out, and my parents are not millionaires and don't want to have them. They're just financing you and they're agonizing. But uh, for the last 28 years, no, there was a least problem, there's so much uh, support, and people are so happy to support monks, amazing, huge blessing. And I see so many benefits in not having money. And one big benefit is uh, once people know that, is an incredible filter. Because everyone who just wants money or other material benefits from me they know that they're not getting that. They, they, will, they will not approach me. They will not even come here. It's like having a, a really super smart mind-reading bouncer at the gate there. Because even if you're super rich and you're paying for the top bouncers for your parties or whatever you're doing there, how would these people know? You will not even know yourself. If you're really rich, the big problem is you know, that probably virtually everyone who tries to associate with you and is after the money is one big problem that rich people have. They can only be lying or maybe on old friends who they know from the time before they were rich or maybe on other people who are super rich so that they're not really so keen on getting more money from them or anything. But this kind of situation you know, that uh, people who are egoistic, stingy, materialistic, who just want to get money, that they just don't come. But I'm totally uninteresting for them. I can't, can't get that from monks. And I have that around me continuously all the time. And when I travel, because I don't have money, they usually pick me up at the airport some month. And I tend to meet some of the best people in, in that uh, town or that city, straight at the airport. Maybe not in the uh, so-called high society in worldly terms, or the richest or the most famous, but in, uh, in uh, hard qualities, uh, usually in, uh, vastly above average, often very, very good people. And the moment I arrive, and then, then it continues like that all the time. There's a huge blessing now i uh, thinking about. Uh, that comes uh, from the words the Buddha has given us. And the greatest thing is having opportunities for developing uh, bhavana. Now for sure we have to train ourselves uh, to cultivate the Eightfold Path in all situations, even when we are busy or working, when we are having social interaction, when you're doing uh, emails or shopping, or cooking, uh, having meetings in your job and so on. But still, in particular for developing the samadhi and uh, advanced insight, the external conditions are important. And I felt a strong sense of gratitude and the modern appreciation that we have a community who was willing to uh, let go and then sell a very comfy suburban Vihara where people can get much quicker and easily and start a forest monastery where access is a bit more difficult, longer drive, but where one has the air of seclusion and has what the Buddha called Viveka. 
Eka vihavi in the dwelling alone. Pantantra sayanasanang in the Ovada party mock in a secluded resting place. And of course, it takes much more uh, effort and money and diff more difficult. If you just buy in a, a kind of house, three floor house in the suburb, you can put 20 monks in there you know, on a small property and you know, each has their own room. It would be much easier to organize and so on you know, than having kutis you know, on, on the hill in, in nature. But if you're walking in the corridor of a three-floor house in a full moon night, <laughs> or if you're walking uh, like me yesterday on that uh, timber walking path and overlooking the national park, and you have no doubts in your mind what's the difference and which one is the more conducive to meditation. Uh, really, outstanding that even here at the stomach hall, you have quite a bit of that feeling. Actually, in Sri Lanka, after the uh, crisis in the Sasana in the first century, when they had war and occupation and famine and so on, sickness, that's uh, when they first were writing down the Tipitaka. It was on that occasion because they suddenly noticed that one particular part of the scriptures, they could find only one monk who could remember it by heart. And he was a very difficult, cranky and impolite, not very well-behaved old monk. And even the very learned Namahatheva had to wheedle him because he had to teach them that particular scripture. He was the only one who still knew it fully by heart. It was a final trigger and they decided they have to wind it down. But another thing which happened around the same time there was a reorganization of many monasteries and they started the courtyard structure. Now that is like three sides, like a letter U with a building where the monks have their cells, a central courtyard and then a vihava on the open side of the U, which is much easier to maintain. But obviously you're lacking seclusion. This is much better than living in a high-rise building, but it's obviously no longer under these kutis. Having single kutis for every single monastic practitioner is obviously a huge effort. And you, if you want to have them secluded, you need a large area and have to put them separate by quite a bit. But this is the original lifestyle the Buddha encouraged. And we can have that here in, in Australia in 21st century when you have things like Donbass War and you have Gaza and you have uh, uh, capitalism and monopolies and exploitation. I don't know. I mean, you know all the bad stuff we have, but we do have that. And it's almost like a little miracle and a big source of joy and happiness for me and feelings of uh, appreciation and mood and uh, Sympathetic joy, rejoicing, mudita. And uh, I like to express it uh, to all of you for that support. 25 years here in Australia, 25 as a big honor to you all. <laughs>